So welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Uh, the purpose of this group, we've actually started it back in 20, uh, actually 2020, kind of in response to COVID. And ever since then, we every other week, we invite speakers from all across the world, really, uh, to talk a variety of different topics pertaining to commercial real estate. And today, you know, I... I I'm really honored to have Bob Knackle on, on the show. Uh, if you don't know who Bob Knackle is, you've probably been living under a rock, uh, in particular in the last few years. I mean, he's been very active on, on social media, but he's been probably on the Mount Rushmore as far as it comes when it comes to commercial real estate brokerage, been operating in the New York uh, metro area for many, many years, has sold buildings, not only just in New York, but other places as well. And I'm really excited to kind of dive into the topic of commercial real estate brokerage because, you know, again, a lot of the listeners of this podcast are in the space, so. Welcome. Well, welcome, Bob. Good. Raphael, great to be with you today. And uh, yeah, I've uh, by, by the uh, gray hair, you can see I've uh, been around for a while. I'm in year number 40 of uh, brokering in New York and uh, fortunately still love it as much today as I did the day I started. So uh, it's, uh, it's a career uh, and a hobby for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel very blessed that uh, that I found a job that uh, I love so much. Definitely. No. And and so for those of you guys, I'm sure many of you know who Bob is, but there's some of you who may or may not know. So what I'd like to do at the beginning is just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, what got you started in, in the, the commercial real estate business? Sure. Well, uh, I'll take you back to 1981. I'm a freshman at the Wharton School uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Wanted to be the next Gordon Gecko, like every other Wharton kid. Uh, and I grew up in northern New Jersey, so I wanted to get a summer job uh, between freshman and sophomore year that would look good on my resume. Uh, went around Bergen County, dropping my resume off at every commercial bank and investment bank I saw. Uh, came out of a Payne Weber office across the hall. I saw Coldwell Banker, thought the place was a bank. Uh, I dropped my resume off. Um, they ended up hiring me for the summer. None of the banks were hiring kids, college kids for the summer. I took the job, almost didn't go on the interview when I found out it was a real estate company. Uh, but I loved it from day one, went back my next two summers, uh, and then started with CB in Manhattan when I got out of school in 1984. Uh, I show up the first day and, uh, I met Paul Massey there, um, we uh, there were several folks at CB with a lot more experience, obviously, and uh, they weren't going to spend a lot of time with us. So literally day two on the job, uh, Paul and I said to each other, hey, let's let's work together, split everything 50 50, see how it goes. Uh, and that was the start of a 30 year partnership. Uh, we left CB in 1988 uh, to form Massey Knackle, started with just the two of us. Uh, and a secretary and uh, grew that business uh, to 250 people. Um, we had CoStar started tracking the market in 2001. From 2001 to 2014, when we sold the business, the number two company in New York had sold about 1,500 properties. Massinacle sold over 5,000. Uh, and we sold the business to Cushman and Wakefield for $100 million uh, at the end of 2014. I was at, um, at CNW for three and a half years, uh, left in September of 18, went to JLL with 53 people, all of whom had worked with me at Massey Nackle, and I've been at JLL since. So, um, you know, in my course of my career, uh, as of last week, I've sold 2,283 buildings. Um, most of them is maybe five or six outside New York City, but most of them in New York City, about $22 billion worth of property. Uh, and as I said, I, uh, I love the business as much today as I, I did the day I started. That's amazing. No. And, and, and if you guys, like I said, if you guys haven't had a chance to follow Bob on all his social platforms, he does relay a lot of the different lessons he's learned over the years and, and just provides a phenomenal context pertaining to brokerage. And so one of the things I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about was, you know, obviously the, the, the breakup or the makeup of this audience is those in, individuals who are probably earlier in the career, uh, they skew earlier, but also somewhere, some people in the, in the mid of their career as well, between the ages of, let's say 28 to 40 as well. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to kind of dive into some of the early years within your business so that we can provide some strategies and context to those individuals who want to advance in their career. And so one of the things I'd like to learn is, you know, you mentioned that 
you you sought a summer job, you you thought you thought with the 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 firm that you were looking to join, you know, you initially thought it was a bank, but realized it was a brokerage. You decided to take a leap of faith and and jump into it. Realized you really liked the business. I guess one of the things that I'm kind of curious about is what are some of the strategies that you implemented right when you got started, or maybe you learned as you got along that really made you have great success in particular early on before you jumped off and, and started Massey Nackle with your business partner? Yeah, well, Raphael, I think that that kind of gets to a, uh, a macro uh, thought or philosophy about what we have seen work for people uh, and what doesn't. Um, I think that, um, uh, that having passion for the business is a very important thing. Um, having an expertise um, and a, a, a competitive spirit, also very important. So what I, what I tell young folks uh, is that um, you have to find, expose yourself to as many aspects of the business as possible and find what really resonates with you, what you really love. Uh, because passion is a very important ingredient. Um, and, and the reason is that no matter how good you are, um, you're going to have challenging times. This is a it, this is a very simple business, but it's very hard, um, and uh, it takes that passion to get you through those tough times that you inevitably are going to encounter. A lot of folks are having tough times today, uh, given what market conditions are. Um, but you want to, uh, if you have that passion, you'll break through. Um, we always looked for a very competitive nature in folks. Uh, because the business is highly competitive. Uh, and so we look for things like team sports or uh, captain of the debating team or editor of the school newspaper, something that exhibited uh, excellence within a, a competitive environment. Uh, and then two aspects of the business that I think are critical is number one, desire. Um, you know, we always ask people to try to get inside their psyche, you know, in the interviews, who do you want to be a hero to? And why? Uh, and that said a lot about what the desire of that individual was. Uh, and then uh, another key ingredient is discipline uh, and having the discipline to do the things that we do every day. Look, real estate brokerage is, we're, we're not curing cancer here. You know, we're, we're doing a, a very simple thing, um, it, but it, it takes a lot of stick to itiveness. It takes a lot of doing very uh, mundane and repetitive things over and over, like prospecting calls, sending out mailings, things like that. And uh, you have to be very, very disciplined in order to do those things. Uh, you know, I always say day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, in my case, decade after decade. Um, but you you need to have the discipline. You know, Abe Lincoln said, um, that discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. Uh, and I think the folks who can keep their eye on what they really want most in their life um, tend to have more discipline in terms of doing those things that need to be done, those very fundamental, basic, blocking and tackling type of things that you need to do to succeed in the brokerage world. Absolutely. And, and you re refer to, you know, sports and other other competitive endeavors. And I, I think, you know, what I've what I've learned just through obviously being in the business and then talking to a lot of people who are early on in the career. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, I'm only four years in myself, so I consider myself pretty early on in my career as well. But, you know, I think initially with with those individuals who I've seen stick around and have success is they don't tie the the immediacy they, they don't they don't tie their results to immediate action because in reality i would imagine that this is probably similar in your case where you know you 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 have to put in a lot of work and effort early on and you may or may not have significant amount of results to show for it and so those individuals who you know kind of put in a lot of effort and then they get disheartened because they're not seeing the results immediately obviously that that can really affect their ability or desire to want to continue to do the same things over and over and over again, yeah, even though I long term. Think, yeah, Raphael, that's such a great point. Um, you, you have to have a long term perspective on this business. Um, it, this business is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, it's planting seeds. You know, when you're making prospecting calls, you're planting seeds for the future. You have to also put everything in context in terms of what your expectations of success are. So for instance, 
Like I know in, in Manhattan, for instance, which is where I do a lot of my business, um, south of 96th Street, there's 27,649 buildings. The average turnover rate of that stock is 2.6% over the last 39 years. And if you figure that half the stuff that goes on the market actually trades, that means only 5% of the stuff will be available at any one time. So 19 out of every 20 prospecting calls you make is not going to produce a lead. You have to be on board with that. And so you have to go into it with the mentality, hey, if I call 19 people and they all hang up on me, I got to be feeling great, not disheartened that 19 people in a row hang up, hung up. I feel great because the probability the next call is going to be a good one is really high. And so I think you have to realize that, you know, you this is a long-term business. You develop relationships with people. You have to prove yourself to be trustworthy to folks. Uh, you know, people will talk to who they know and like. They'll do business with people they trust. You don't build trust overnight. It takes a while, but by con constantly um, delivering uh, information of value, providing value to your clients, builds that trust. And over time, you start to build a business, but you can't expect that things are going to happen overnight because it just doesn't work that way. Definitely. Phenomenal advice, really. So one of the things I'm kind of curious about, you kind of had mentioned you know, the, the, one of the main factors for success is obviously discipline and, and part of discipline, in my opinion, also involves creating systems. So that it makes it easier for you to do the things you need to do over and over and over again, as before we went live on, on LinkedIn, you know, uh, if you guys are watching this right now, you could see that, uh, Bob's in the map room, uh, it's become, you know, Twitter and LinkedIn famous. He's, you know, he's always in there, you know, obviously taking people in and showcasing the different things that he knows about the market. And so, you know, that's part of the systems I'm sure that you've created. What, what type of, what type of structures have you put in place? And maybe if we can walk through some of the, some of the things you do on a day to day to just operate in a, at a high level, like you have been over the last several decades. Sure. And, and that has, that always changes. You know, I, I think that one of the principles that you have to have is you have to establish a set of core values for yourself, things that are important to you. Uh, and you have to always stay true to those core values while, while constantly adopting and adapting to changes in the marketplace. Um, so over time, you know, we have always been big believers that the, the way that you create the best value in yourself is to be a specialist in something. Specialization, and it's certainly it's a lot easier to specialize in one thing in a very large, dense market. Uh, in smaller markets, you, you by, by definition, have to do a variety of things. Um, but to the extent you can specialize in one thing and articulate a value proposition of what you do, um, that gives you the ability to differentiate yourself from the hundreds or thousands of people that are trying to do the same thing. Uh, and that differentiation leads to a competitive advantage. The, the reason that we suggest being an expert at something, and if you read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, Collins says that the difference between great companies and good companies are that the great companies identify the thing that they want to do better than anyone else in the world. And everything they do, every decision they make, it's all geared towards achieving that position. The best way to do that in the real estate brokerage business is to be a specialist in one area and to know that market better than anyone. Uh, I maintain that most publicly available data sources from third-party information aggregators is not great information, and it's available to everybody. I can get a high school kid to go in and pull a report from a third-party information aggregator. That's the same report any any broker with 20 years of experience could pull. That, that's adding zero value to your client. If you create your own proprietary database that nobody else has and you demonstrate ex expertise in that area, it will enable you to develop relationships with people beyond what other folks can do. Uh, it will allow you to uh, build trust uh, and you bring real value to your clients. So what what the, the map room uh, kind of started out of the fact that a big part of my practice has always been selling land. And in terms of doing valuations, 
for folks on land sites. I've been frustrated always in the the lack of clarity relative to the development pipeline. So for years, I've wanted to get out and actually do a physical count of the buildings that were under construction in Manhattan. Well, the, the pandemic provided a perfect opportunity to do that. Um, the streets were completely empty. Every store was closed. And so I thought, hey, this is the perfect time to go out and actually do a physical count. So uh, we made copies of the, the maps. Uh, went out into the streets, drove to a, a point, got out of the car, walked around for a half hour uh, with a bunch of highlighters and identified different types of properties on the map, uh, you know, buildings that were under construction or de demolished, uh, potential development sites that looked like they were built to only a fraction of their maximum buildable density, uh, potential assemblage sites, um, finished up that, that project. It was 220 hours in the field. Um, we got back to the office, taped all the pieces of the map together. Now the map is, uh, and I'll show you, it's 24 feet long, 10 feet wide, and uh, has literally everything you could possibly want to know about what is out in the field on this map. We followed that up with thousands of hours of research on each of those sites. Uh, we have a pipeline now that that essentially tracks every square inch of residential rental buildings, condo buildings, hotels, office buildings, a miscellaneous bucket for everything else. Um, so we have a, a very, very accurate pipeline, which helps us determine the value of sites based on how much competition that site will have when the product comes into the market. We've also studied comparable sales, and I have a, a land index that disaggregates the land sale data into those same five buckets. We have that data going back to 1984, um, and uh, you know these data sets are creating something that nobody else in the industry has. So um, you know historically, my my win ratio on pitches has always been about 26 percent. Uh, I've had nine pitches in the map room so far. We're nine for nine, uh, and it really has been a very distinct competitive advantage relative to what other folks have. And it, yeah, it took a heck of a lot of time and a lot of elbow grease, but the fact is, it is a, a database and an information resource that no one else has, uh, and that creates the competitive advantage. And, you know, I always say that you have to understand what business you're really in. Uh, the real estate business is not really real estate. The real estate business is about information and relationships. And uh, when you focus on that and realize that what you're really selling is information and the relationships you have, then you really want to roll your sleeves up and get to know your sector of the market better than anyone else. And if you can do that, you're creating an annuity for yourself. Year after year, you're going to make uh, a lot of money just because you have something that provides real value to your clients. And at the end of the day, uh, we're only as good as the job we do for our clients. So everything that, that's that been done is thinking about how do I help the client? How is this going to? You're able to provide to them. And if you're keeping the client number one and doing everything to help the client, you you, you don't make mistakes. That's amazing. So I guess what you would advise and the fact that you were able to do that's amazing. But but what would you would you advise, I guess, in this scenario is that individuals who are, you know, in the brokerage space, there should be a, a dedication or, or, or commitment to aggregating data based on their current market. So if your focal area is retail in, in Minneapolis, then get very clear on all the different activity that's happening in the space, compile data, have have specific information that only you have compared to CoStar or some of these other platforms. And then you, that, that in, in that scenario, you can add additional value to potential clients. And even as you're doing your outreach and, and building relationships with people, you know, you become kind of the watering hole as it comes to this information. Is that correct? We had a, there he is. Hey, Bob. Hey, hey. sorry about that. No, right. no worries. No worries. No worries. No, I, I, I thought I lost you for a second. Technology is great until it isn't. 
It so is. I just an lost the internet connection there for a sec. Sorry, everybody. No worries. Not a problem at all. No. So I just, you know, just wanted to clarify a point. Obviously, you know, what, what Bob's done is, is amazing. And, and, and he was so deliberate about being able to get out into the marketplace and really getting an understanding of what's going on, the, the opportunities that are present themselves. And, you know, that, that just goes along with the canvassing and getting out there as far and getting an understanding of what your current market is. So would you advise, I guess, for, for those who are listening to the podcast and are watching this live, would you advise that there should be a piece of your day or a piece of your week dedicated towards getting out into your market and tr tracking or, or compiling data that is pertinent to whatever property type or whatever property, yeah, whatever types of properties that you guys are focused on? Is that correct? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, again, we're in the information business. The better quality your information, the more information you have that nobody else has, the better. Uh, and that's how you differentiate yourself. And this can this can be accretive to what you're doing right from the start of your career. So if you just started out, I'll bring you back to uh, 1985, um, Paul and I had sold three buildings and we were competing against folks who had been in the business for, for a long time. And, you know, we had a very, very simple value proposition back then. We told people, look, we only sell buildings. We only represent sellers. We only work on exclusives and we only work in your neighborhood. And so owners would say to us, well, you, you haven't sold that many buildings. Said, yeah, we haven't. We only sold three, but one was down the block. One was across the street. One was right next door to yours. We know more about this neighborhood than anybody else. So we can be a better advocate for you in terms of convincing buyers whether you should pay more for your property. And you know what? We got hired again, and that approach gave us tremendous traction, uh, built the business uh, relatively quickly, but it was because we were really, we were differentiating ourselves through the quality of the information we had. So we think that's the probably the easiest way uh, to be different than anybody is to have information systems nobody else has. Uh, and, um, you know, that that is a, a real... Uh, thing that can separate you from the pack. That's awesome. Great advice. So one of the things I'm kind of curious about is, you know, obviously there's a sect of, of the, the listenership that is somewhat more established in their career. Maybe they're established with a brokerage, but now they're looking to transition and do something similar to what you and Paul did back in the day is to start to establish a brokerage. I guess, what were some of the reasons for wanting to do that on your guys's end? And then I guess, what were some of the challenges that you faced as a result of, you know, kind of going out on your own? Right. Well, it, it definitely it's not easy to start your own business. And as I say to to everyone, um, there are, are pros and cons to everything. Nothing's perfect. Uh, nothing is is uh, is is all good or all bad. There are pros and cons, whether you have your own business or you work for somebody else, whether you're at a small shop or a midsize shop or a large shop. Uh, there are positives and negatives associated with each of those scenarios. So I always tell folks, try to, you know, maximize the, the positive aspects of the environment you're in uh, and try to minimize the negative uh, aspects of, of uh, the scenario you're in and do the best you can. Um, you know, we, we went out and started the, the company uh, mainly because we were a little frustrated that our boss at CB didn't implement platform rules uh, equally. We had a system that we thought we were operating in. And as soon as one of the more senior folks came up with a, a deal that was in our territory, um, went to the boss and said, hey, I'm not going to bring these young kids in. They don't know what they're doing. And the boss backed them up and said, hey, guys, you're not being brought in. And we said, well, that's not fair. We're bringing these guys in on the stuff that we're getting. And um, it was really a, uh, a situation where um, we just felt it, the, the platform wasn't being implemented the way that it was represented to us. So we left and we said, you know what, we're going to set up a shop with rules and guidelines, and those guidelines are going to apply to us, uh, as well as to somebody who just starts on their first day. Uh, and we never had any special deals for anybody. Everybody's splits were the same. The rules were the same. Uh, and even after the company, you know, by 2001, we were the, the number one firm in New York. Um, 
the rules apply to every senior broker the same as they did to somebody who was in their first week on the job. And that was one of the things that I think is um, a great lesson that came out of that is you can't have special deals for everybody. Everything has to be equal. Um, and the more that you can encourage people to work together as a team, uh, the better. And by not having any internal conflicts, uh, that helps with that camaraderie. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and, and as you mentioned, I mean, you, you operated your business until 2014 and had your exit, but at the time of the sale, you guys had hundreds of agents across the different boroughs in, in New York city. You know, it took a while to get to that point. So as far as the, the scaling is concerned, what were some of the challenges that you guys faced as you started to grow an organization like that? Because I mean, I'm sure the way that it was being run when you first started was night and day difference to when you were able to, to perform your exit. Yeah, sure. There were, you know, it was kind of an interesting journey from, we started in November of 88 by, by September of 01, we had 21 people. Um, and our, our platform was set up on a geographical orientation. We divided Manhattan up into two different territories, had one broker working in each and, Back then, with the uh, the volume and inaccuracy of the publicly available data, that geographic orientation worked really well. I, I would say that today, I think product specialization is much more important than geographic specialization, uh, but a product specialization with a, a geography overlaid on top of it. Um, but when we filled all the sale territories in Manhattan, we were faced at, with an inflection point. Uh, and that inflection point was, okay, what do we do now? Do we go sell buildings in the outer boroughs or do we start doing office leasing and debt or something else? Um, and we decided at the time, look, we know how to sell buildings. We don't know about these other disciplines. Let's go to Queens and open an office. And so we went to Queens and opened an office in Queens. We then went to Brooklyn, opened up there. Um, and then 9-11 happened. Um, a lot of people were nervous about what was going to happen. The country was also in a recession at the time. Um, and so a lot of companies were downsizing, letting people go. Uh, up till that point, uh, Paul and I were interviewing every candidate ourselves. We said, you know what? New York City's tough. It's strong. We're going to bounce back. Uh, we went out and hired a director of HR said, go out and hire all these great quality people that have, have been let go and downsized. Uh, and within two years, we had 150 people at the firm. Uh, and just at that time, as the, the, the market was coming out of that recession, uh, the outer borough started to catch on fire. Um, you know, we had opened offices there before it was cool to be in the outer boroughs of New York. Uh, and so we, way, we were way ahead of everybody else. And that was, it was a very counterintuitive move because had the market not bounced back, we would have been out of business for sure. But we just really believed in the, in the city, um, made that bet, uh, worked out really well for us. You know, and then we had another inflection point when we filled all the um, all the territories in New York City, we said, okay, what do we do now? Do we increase geographically like we did in the past? Do we go to Boston or Philly or Chicago? Or do we do more for the, for the clients that we already have relationships with? Um, and we determined that had we gone to Chicago, which would have been our next office, um, we would have had to explain to people what we did in addition or who we were in addition to to what we did so we said you know what we have very long and deep relationships with a lot of people in new york let's just get into the debt business uh, very synergistic with our sales business and let's do retail leasing and so at that point we opted to increase the services that we provided as opposed to the geography that we operated within so different decision um, decisions at different points in time, but you have to kind of look at the horizon, figure out what you think makes the most sense, and um, you know make uh, make the decisions that you think are best at the time. That's amazing, and and obviously that leads all the way back to the beginning where you mentioned your values and what you were trying to offer to the marketplace, and obviously you kept to that that vision and. Another thing that I found very interesting is you 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 kind of you doubled down in a period of time that was great uncertainty, in particular in New York City around 9/11. I can only imagine the 
the uncertainty that was present during that time, but you understood that there, there could potentially be an opportunity, at least in, you know, being able to expand your footprint within the market during that period of time. And obviously it, it, it did well for you, which is amazing. Yeah, we got, we got lucky, Raphael. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, we, um, we just, we really, really believed in the city. We believed it would bounce back. Uh, we put our money where our mouth was. Um, and that expansion at that time, when everyone else was downsizing and we were going in the opposite direction, really served us well. And so when the market really started to bounce back uh, in 04, um, you know, we were so well positioned to take advantage of that. So 04, 05, 06, 07, uh, it's just our, the performance of the co co company was off the charts and it really was a great time for us, but it was all because we were way ahead of the curve in terms of growing uh, when nobody else wanted to. Okay. Oh, that's amazing advice. And that kind of leads us to the next, next question, which, you know, as we're recording this for those, of you guys are watching uh, it is October of 2023. We've been through a period of economic uncertainty. There's also a lot of geopolitical uh issues as well that, that we're facing as, uh, and, and a lot of the people who listen to this podcast, as we mentioned before, you know, there, there are a lot of younger brokers and mid, maybe even brokers that are somewhat more established in their career, but maybe they haven't gone through a period of certain uncertainty like this. I mean, really since maybe 2012 and beyond, I mean, we've really been in a period of expansion uh, outside of uh, COVID, uh, at least the first few months of COVID. And then after that, when, when, you know, it was one of the best times from the investment landscape to just invest with interest rates as low as they were. So I guess one thing that I would ask you is, I guess, what would you recommend for those individuals who are kind of uncertain about what's going on, you know, and, and they are trying to continue to grow in their business? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, again, if you, you we're all going through a tough time. If you have the passion for the business and you really love this, figure out how to hang in there. Because one thing I will tell you is that the market has always been, is, and always will be cyclical. And I guarantee you the market is going to come back. I can't guarantee you when that's going to happen, but it is definitely going to happen. So put yourself in a position to take advantage of that bounce back when it does come back. Because what I've seen after every one of these downturns, whether it was the SNL crisis in the early 90s or the recession in the early 2000s or the GFC, coming out of every downturn, there's a whole new crop of folks who achieve superstar status. And that's whether it's in the brokerage business or in the legal world or in banking or investing, there's always a new crop of folks who rise to the top. And those are the people who I think took the time to really position themselves well during the downturn. Uh, you know, increase the quality and the integrity of your information systems. Create marketing materials that will position you to get business when we come out of this. One of the things, he did hand me the, the development site book. One of the things I did during the pandemic that has really served me well, you know, I mentioned we do a lot of development site work, which is um, what, what was the genesis of the NACL map room. I took the time during the pandemic to put this book together. It's a book of my development site sales. And I have over 200 um, sales in here, um, which is really cool. We have before pictures, after pictures, right up on the, on the sale, a testimonial obtained from the seller. And now if I hand this 250 page book to a potential seller, it gives you automatic credibility. Now, how many hours did it take to put that together? I don't know, but a lot, maybe 100, 150 hours of work to get that book done. But now, and I did that when the market was very slow, but it's put me in a position to take advantage of things when they bounce back. So think about, you know, the time you spend, and, and that is time spent working on your business as opposed to in your business, which there's a very, very big difference between the two. And we have to be mindful of it. When, when we're working on deals, we're pitching business, we're meeting with clients, we're, we're marketing the properties we've been hired to sell. We're working in our business. And often when you're working in your business, it's kind of a whirlwind. You know, I mentioned my, my broker coach who I've been working with for 12 years, Rob Santamassimo, refers to it as the, the, the brokerage whirlwind. You're in the whirlwind, you're going 100 miles an hour, there's things going on, you're busy, the day goes by in the blink of an eye. 
And all you've been doing is trying to be as proactive in, as you can and reacting to other people all day. And that's working in your business. But the folks who are the most successful are the people who are able to take a step back all the time and to work on your business. What does that mean? It's, it's thinking about new strategies, uh, new tactics to implement, things that you want to get to. You want to become an expert in this particular area. Are you getting your data systems up to speed? Are you figuring a new way to prospect? Are you, are you looking at directionally where you want to be in three years and five years and 10 years from now and how are you going to get there? And so, you know, the best time to work on your business is probably on the weekend when you're not in the whirlwind, uh, when you can think clearly, think about what you want to achieve, what objectives you have uh, and how you want to get there. Um, and so working on your business is really, really important. And it's almost impossible to work on your business when you're working in your business. Uh, but you figure out what, where you want to go, how are you going to get there? That's working on your business. And then uh, working in your business will help you achieve that objective, hopefully. That's amazing advice, really. So committing time, uh, especially in a period of, of economic slowdown, and obviously on the weekends to dedicating time towards creating the systems and then focusing on longevity and how you're going to be able to build your business over time. That's that's some great advice. And and if you guys haven't had a chance, I would highly encourage you guys to look up Bob's baseball card, uh, kind of referencing, uh, you know, the the cyclical nature of real estate. He had he had a took some time to create a, a card that that describes all the different transactions he was involved in over his career. And you'll see there's periods of times where you know, there's, there's slow uh, activity. And then all of a sudden you'll see a big spike in, in activity thereafter. And so, you know, again, again, real estate is a cyclical uh, business. And so I just want to throw, shoot, shoot that out there because that's a, obviously a very famous uh, uh, picture that, that, I, that I know a lot of people in the space already know about, but I thought for those who don't, don't, it's worth checking out. Yeah, and for those of you who are watching and not listening, this is the, uh, the baseball card this is actually a nice, uh, Total ripoff of the uh, 1970 Topps baseball card on the back are the historical statistics. Uh, if any of you would like one of these, you could just email me at bob.knackle at jll.com. Happy to send you one. But that was another thing that came out of the, the pandemic uh, that was something that uh, you know I thought would be uh, helpful in terms of um, market awareness, market presence. Um, you know, I think in the investment sales world, there are two main buckets of types of, of transactions. One is the institutional world, uh, which is a relatively small. Uh, and then there's pr the private capital world, which is basically everybody else, individuals, families, things like that. And most of us are, are active in the, the private capital world. And if you follow me on social media, you know, I often say that it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Uh, and so you have to think of ways to achieve market presence, to be top of mind with people, uh, to have them uh, think of you when they want to transact. If you, you go back to the statistics I mentioned earlier, where the average turnover rate in New York is only 2.6% of the total stock of buildings in any one year. That means on average, when someone buys a building in New York, they own it for 40 years before they sell it. So people are not always transacting. Uh, you want to be top of mind when they do want to transact. Um, and so creating marketing materials like that is a way to stay top of mind uh, with them. And hopefully they think of you uh, when they decide they want to or need to sell. Great advice. All right. So what I'm going to go ahead and do now is we have a good amount of people on the Zoom call and also people who are watching on LinkedIn Live. I wanted to give us an opportunity to ask questions. So this is the Q&A portion of the meeting. Uh, feel free to type away in the chat box just so we're not all uh, talking on, this, on the same line. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So let's see what's in the chat right now. Oh, Nick just said hello. Nick is at uh, Nick Rasanti with with our office as well. He's uh, how are there. you, Nick? All right. So uh, I'm looking at LinkedIn Live. Aviva. So she uh, she asks, "Hey, Bob, Raphael, how do you handle all the lenders slash title reps that want to take us to lunch? Go to lunch or say no?" <laughs> well, I I think that um, you know one of the interesting things about being a broker is you have two two main assets: um, your knowledge and your time you are always going to, um, to be increasing your knowledge base. 
you can't really make more time. You can use time more efficiently and effectively. You can leverage time, but you can't create more of it. Um, so I encourage you to read, there's a great book written by a Harvard professor, Bill Urey, called The Power of a Positive No. Uh, you have to say no sometimes. And with title folks, I, I, that's a very, very challenging business. But I always tell title people, and I believe this, that the attorneys always decide what title company to use. I've never in, you know, over 2,200 transactions, I've never had an opportunity to recommend a title person. So I just say, look, I appreciate you want to have coffee, whatever. I can't get you any business and, you know, go take the time rather than meeting with me, go develop a relationship with attorney, an attorney that might be able to get some business for you. So, you know, sometimes you just have to say no. That's some great advice. One of the questions I had, what are some of the, the publications or resources that you would recommend to people to follow along with? Obviously, I, you know, I'm sure some some of it's market specific, but I don't know if you have any in particular that you would be willing to recommend right now. Yeah, sure. Like I read a lot. Um, uh, you know, one of my mentors, is Steve Siegel, who's the chairman of Global Brokerage at CBRE. And uh, Steve always said to me, uh, you know, read as much as you can, understand as much as you can. Um, I think that you, I read generally all the real estate publications in New York. Uh, I try to get my hands on every brokerage company's research reports uh, to see what they're saying. And it's interesting. They're all, they all have differences. Nobody agrees on everything because you, some count things that others don't. But I think the, the better uh, informed you are, the better perspective you have, it's going to put you in a better position to advise clients. Uh, and you want to give clients the best advice possible, and the more knowledgeable you are, the better advice you're going to be able to give them. So I would read as much as you can. Again, weekend work. Uh, you don't want to be reading in the middle of the workday, but um, you know, stack stuff up, and you know, maybe on uh, Saturday before the 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 wife or husband and kids get up, uh, maybe do a little reading, that kind of thing. But um, you know, you want to be as informed as possible. Great advice. All right. So Nick asks, Bob, many brokers aspire to own their own real estate and or develop real estate. Have you gotten into being a landlord slash developer? If not, why have you stuck strictly to brokerage? Okay. Yeah. I um, I get asked that question a lot and I, I've never been a principal on the broker side. Um, and I will tell you, I know many brokers that very successfully have been brokers and uh, principals. Uh, in the business. And what I do it may not be the right thing or the wrong thing. It, it's just what works for me. But in the years that we had Massey Knackle, and that was you know 26 years of, of running that business, every waking moment, I just spent trying to figure out how to make that company as valuable as possible. I didn't want to spend five seconds looking to buy properties uh, or uh, do anything other than figure out how to make the company strong. Um, and I also think that it's a conflict of interest inherently. Um, so, you know, and after we sold the company, I said, you know, all right, what do I want to do now? Do I want to be an investor, a developer, stay a broker? And it occurred to me, you know, I really love brokering. I actually love the business. I want to keep doing it. And I think that it is an inherent conflict of interest because I never wanted to be faced with calling uh, a buyer and saying, hey, I just listed this property. Uh, it's a great property. You should take a look at it and have them say to me, well, Bob, if it's such a great property, why didn't you buy it? Um, so I just think it's uh, inherently a conflict of interest uh, for me anyway. I, I don't like conflicts of interest. I don't uh, want to have to remember what I say to anybody. Uh, so keeping a very narrow uh, value proposition is a way to, to achieve that. And um, you know, it's just again, I know a lot of friends who are brokers and principals, and I uh, I commend them for doing well uh, in that way. But it's just something that I my my life, I want to keep it simple and uh, not being a principal has kept it simple for me. Amazing. All right. So next up is Harrison. Uh, they ask. Sorry, we're getting a ton of ton of questions now. All right, so how have you used the new change in technology over the course of your career with everything becoming more advanced? Yeah, well, interesting. So when I started in 84, 
no computer on my desk, no fax machine, no cell phone. Um, the, the world has changed completely, but I think you have to keep up with technology. And I, I will admit, I was a very slow adapter to email when it first came out. I remember my first client, uh, Richard Browse, said to me, so Bob, can I communicate with you by email? And I'm like, email, what's that? Um, and so I was, uh, I'm, I, technology is not my friend. Um, but I'm trying to adopt it as much as possible. And, and today, especially, I think AI is going to change the world. So I've been uh, very in tune with, with what AI can do. And I'm adopting some AI applications uh, to what I do every day. But I think you have to uh, maintain a, an edge. Uh, and uh, technology enables you to, to have that edge, I think. Great, great points. Great advice. Uh, next up is Amanda. She asks, what is your biggest piece of advice for a new broker starting out in today's market? Specific things to focus on with planting seeds or targeting people? Yeah, I, I think that, again, very fundamentally, you want to be a market expert. There are probably a lot of people, no matter what size market you're in, where you're operating, whether you're doing sales or leasing or whatever you're doing, debt. There's a lot of folks wanting to do the same thing. Why should somebody work with you as opposed to someone else? Uh, and so I think um, becoming an expert in a certain field will serve you very, very well over time. So study the market, get to know the market. You know, how many buildings are in the area that you cover? What, how many have sold each year uh, for the past several years? What's the average sale price? What's the average cap rate? Have data sets that you personally verify where you can create value. Put together a newsletter that you send out to clients so that they see that you have expertise. You wanna, you wanna implement a, uh, a scenario where uh, you are proof stacking every week, every month. What is proof stacking? Uh, putting together a one-page case study on every transaction that you do. Um, you know, my buddy Ed Winslow owns a company called One Page Case Studies. And what we, we've done this at, at MK, still do it today, is you want to demonstrate that you have the capability uh, to do transactions. You've helped other people. So do those case studies, send things out regularly, uh, create market presence, send out, uh, you know, make your calls, get meetings, uh, send out email blasts, send out text messages, send out hard mail. Hard mail is a grossly underutilized and underappreciated technique of interacting with people. But do all that stuff to create market presence and, and be able to deliver uh, something of value to your clients. Um, and I think that's the best thing a young person can do is create value in yourself by having information systems and you know constantly staying in touch with a, a very clearly defined target audience of potential um, clients. Great advice, Bob. All right, next up is Jonathan. So he says, I'm a novice interested in learning more about the world of commercial real estate. Could you could you be a value at, could you, I guess, could you advise on a value add activity to offer a firm to make relationships and or create an, an internship? Also, what's your favorite part of the business? Okay. Um, well, I think you need to learn the business in some way and probably going to work at a, a commercial real estate company is the best way to do that. Um, but should be, you should be reading and learning as much as you can. Again, you know, two biggest assets, knowledge and time become as knowledgeable as you can. Um, and probably the, the aspects of the business I enjoy the most. I love, uh, making prospecting calls. Um, and you hit on that one that says, yeah, I, may, I am thinking about selling my building. That's a great feeling. And I love pitching business, uh, and I love negotiating deals. So, I mean, those are the three three big aspects of the business, but I love all of them. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why this uh, this business is my hobby in addition to being my vocation. Great advice. All right, next up, back, back to Nick. He asks, with you only representing sellers, what do you tell a buyer that wants you to rep them as a dual agent? And I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, say I, I don't do that. 
I, I don't do that. You know, I, I my business, I, I think the more narrowly you define your business, and again, it's a lot easier in a very big, dense market. So if you're in a smaller market, you probably can't do this. But, you know, I only want to represent sellers. I only want to maximize price. I only work on exclusives. And I, I tell people, and they, they don't believe me, but I've actually done this where, you know, if I go pitch a, business, a piece of business and the building that the seller wants to sell is a 12-story purple building on a corner and the seller won't give me an exclusive and the next day a buyer comes into my office and says, Bob, I have a 1031 exchange. I need a 12-story purple building on the corner. I will not tell them about that building. Uh, just because it, it's inefficient, uh, it's a it's a time drag, and I think you stick to one thing, and you have to be able to say no. We can, as brokers, you can get pulled in so many directions so easily that you have to really stick to what you do best and be very disciplined. Uh, and so, you know, if I I I've done I have done out of the the transactions I've done, I've done two deals where I was not the exclusive agent for the seller, but only two, uh, uh, both very fluky situations that just happened. But I, I think the more narrowly you define what you do and you stick to it, uh, the better. Awesome. All right. Next up is Kale. They ask, Raphael, great call as always. Bob, thank you very much for your time. How is your mindset doing a D, how, how is your mindset of doing a deal now compared to what your very first one? If you had any apprehension, anxiety when you started, what what pushed you th through that? Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, there's uh, apprehension and anxiety always. I mean, you know, in this business, uh, you're only as good as your last deal. And the most important deal is the next deal. And I think you have to keep that in mind. So, um, you know, clearly when you've been around for a while and you have a good track record, that makes getting the next deal a little easier. But, you know, the the mindset is the, the way you should think about the business and you're going to avoid making mistakes that that folks often make is think that your client is your mom or your dad. What advice would you give them? And I will tell you, some of the best relationships I, I have had over the years have been with people who I initially told them not to sell their building. They said, Bob, I'm thinking about selling my building. Come meet with me. And I would say, you know what? You shouldn't think about selling now. There's going to be a zoning change that's brewing that's going to increase your value. It's not the right time in the market. Um, they, you know, they're the, for X, Y, and Z reason, don't sell now. And those people have been very surprised that I've given them that advice. But that shows that you're you're looking at the long game. Uh, you're viewing it as a marathon, not a sprint. And in almost every single case, when I've told people not to sell, they've come back to me uh, and had me sell when it was the right time to sell. So, you know, I think the mindset is always think about what's in the client's best interest. If you think that the client is a one of your family members and you give them the same advice, it's really hard to make a mistake. Um, and so I think that is a, that's the mindset going into the deal is what really is in the best interest of this client and how can I make, uh, how can I give them the best advice possible? That's amazing. I love the idea of, of kind of looking at it as it's your close family member, whether it's your mom, dad, grandfather, whoever else. Um, so I appreciate that. All right, Desmond, uh, how do you handle negotiation and conflict resolution in the world of commercial real estate? And then there's another question, but I'll focus on this one right now. Right. Well, you know, conflict resolution, I think, is important. There are always going to be conflicts, but you minimize the conflicts by having um, a an operating platform and a system that is narrowly defined. Um, so, you know, I, I think that conflict is often the result of a lack of communication and a lack of transparency. Um, so again, if you do one thing and you're very clear about what you do, like if I say I only sell buildings, I only represent sellers, I only work on exclusives, only work in this area, that took six seconds to say there's nothing vague about it. You understand exactly what I do and how I do it. The more, the, the more clearly you can articulate what it is you do and how you do it, the, the less conflict you're going to be in. But when you have conflict, the best thing to do is sit down, 
uh, air it out. I always tell people there are three sides to every story. So when you hear one sides one side of the story, don't jump to a conclusion. Uh, there are three sides. There's you know a participant A is side, participant B is side, and then there what really is the truth. And often that that uh, what really is the truth is somewhere between A and B. Um, but uh, I think it's a matter of just talking things through, and that usually resolves most situations if you can look at it from the other person's perspective. Uh, and there are probably things uh, that you weren't aware of or didn't understand, and, and that makes conflict resolution a lot easier. Awesome advice. So we have two more questions, and then we'll 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 be respectful of everyone's time. So uh, next question is is from Desmond. Is again, are there any coaching services in the industry that you would recommend for a new commercial real estate agent or broker? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, call the the Massimo Group. Uh, Rod Santa Massimo has been my coach for twelve years. He will always be my coach. I, I hope to be doing this another 25 or 30 years, believe it or not. Uh, he will be by my side the whole time. Coaching is important because no matter how, you know, I mentioned how important discipline is in this business. No matter how disciplined you are, you could always be more disciplined. The coach will help you with that. Coach will help you with best practices. Uh, coach will hold you accountable. I highly, highly recommend it. And I've seen, I've seen firsthand what Rod has done for me. Uh, working with Rod tripled my income from what I was doing to uh, the best year I've had. And I highly recommend it. Without a coach, you're leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars in commissions on the table. Get a coach. Great advice. Awesome. Cool. All right. Last question. So Michael asks, what emerging trends or areas of opportunity do you see in the current New York City commercial real estate market? Well, there there are always opportunities. The market's always changing. You know, for many years, the retail market was really uh, getting hammered by market conditions. I think retail is one of the bright spots in the market today. Uh, rents have stopped going down, leasing activities picking up, and we're getting investor calls for retail again. Uh, I think the hotel market is one that's on the upswing. We've had a lot of hotel rooms taken offline by conversion to other uses. Uh, and so the, the fundamentals within the hotel sector are very positive. Uh, I think within the office sector, you're going to have a lot of conversion of those buildings and demolition of buildings uh, because the values are getting to the point where if you look at the value of the building plus demolition cost, it's actually lower than land value. So I think there are always opportunities. Things are constantly changing. That's why you have to be on top of trends, follow the market very closely, and look at where those opportunities are. Um, so I think in, in every sector, there are different opportunities for people if you, if you understand the market well enough and you, you, uh, you focus on uh, what people's objectives are and how they want to do things. Awesome advice. Well, Thank you, Bob, for your time. We greatly appreciate everything you've been willing to share today. I know I gained a lot of value from it, and I'm sure the audience does as well. And for those of you guys are going to going to be listening on podcast format and also on YouTube, if people want to learn more about you, connect with you on social, what's the best way to be able to do that? Yeah, just I I, I don't know what my uh, my handles are on the different social media platforms, but just uh, go to look up Bob Knackle, and you'll probably find me out there. Uh, or again, you can email me at bob.knackle at jll.com. And, um, you know, happy to share with you. I have a suggested reading list that I think is very um, uh, useful, uh, particularly for younger folks in the business. I have a lessons learned piece uh, where if you, um, if you follow me on social media, I do a, a Knackle Nuggets um, a bit of advice every Friday. Uh, but I have a summary of, of those and happy to share that information with you. Again, uh, the email address is bob.nackle, K-N-A-K-A-L at jll.com. And, um, you know, I just think everybody, it, it's a tough time today, but take heart. Market is definitely going to get better. Uh, just a question of when. Uh, it always has been cyclical. And it's at times when the market is really bad and everybody thinks, oh, it'll never get better. That's when it'll start to turn. Uh, and I think we're kind of either there or approaching there now. So, uh, you know, better times are right around the corner.
Amazing advice. Again, Bob, we greatly appreciate your time. We, you know, obviously you've been such a big part of the brokerage business really around the country. So I do greatly appreciate everything you've been able to share today. For those of you guys who are listening to this in a podcast format, again, continue to engage, continue to subscribe. Along with that, if you guys are in on this call, continue to come back. We do this every other week and we invite speakers from all across the country. So thanks again, Bob. Thanks again, everyone for tuning in and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, Raphael. See you guys.